Let's turn in our Bible this morning to Psalm 56. Psalm 56. In this psalm, there's a particular text of scripture that I'll leave with you today. It was sent to me on Monday morning by one who belongs to the congregation. And I knew the minute I got it, I said, that's the Lord's word for Sunday morning. Psalm 56, let's hear the word of the Lord. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me. O thou most high, what time I am afraid I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, Then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Amen. We know that the Lord will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now, my text this morning is taken from Psalm 56 and the verse 8. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? And my theme today is simply entitled, God's Record of Your Tears. There are 35 references in the Bible to tears. The first reference is in 2 Kings 20 and 5. God says to Hezekiah, who was lying in his bed, thinking that death was about to descend upon him. And God says, I have heard thy prayers and I've seen thy tears. The last reference is Revelation 21 verse 4, where it says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now, if we think of those 35 references to tears in the Bible, and we add the word weep, or for example, the word wept, which is a synonym for tears and strong crying, you could add, just using the word wept, another 68 references. And the first reference to weep or wept in the Bible was Hagar wept. And of course, we know in Revelation 5 and 4 that John wept in the Isle of Patmos. And of course, when we think of the shortest verse in the Bible, at John 11 and 30, Jesus wept. At the graves of Lazarus. You see, the Bible has a lot to say about tears, a lot to say about weeping, a lot to say about strong crying. And if I add the, the word tears and the word wept and the word weep and, and the word crying, we would get a, a, a multiplicity of references. You see, this is an important subject, a subject of profound significance for the people of God in every generation. You see, many of you as God's people You're no strangers to tears. Is it not true every day, every week? You face a variety of circumstances and situation where where you're just literally reduced to tears, where you just burst into tears. Many of you are facing situations in your life right now. You have burdens. There's a heartache. 
there's a distress, there's a worry that only God knows and only God really sees. And there, there's very few that you'd open up and disclose such feelings and thoughts to. And, and oftentimes you just burst into tears. Well, this is how David felt. David was, was being chased from the throne. He was in the wilderness of Judea. Men were hunting after David's life. And here you've got this reference. My tears. And notice that David just doesn't mention about tears. But he adds something wonderful. Something as profound. God is a record for our tears. He, he knows and sees them. And more than that, he has a record of our tears. Notice what he says. Thou tell us my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? You see, we could talk this morning about God's bottle and God's book. That's how some preachers have given a title to this text. Now, this text, as I said, was sent to me in the early hours of Monday morning. And the minute I looked at it, I began to think about it, pray over it, then I felt most strongly this was God's word for the congregation this morning. I want you to think of three things very carefully. First of all, think about the reality of our tears. David says, my tears. See, David's tears in this situation were real and genuine. They were not crocodile tears. We could talk about crocodile tears. Tears are not real, but David's tears were real and genuine. If we were to discuss this morning the chemistry of tears, isn't it interesting that human beings are the only individuals of God's creation that can cry because of being overcome with emotion? It's interesting that there's different kinds of tears. we were to do a research on the subject of tears, we could think about tears of joy. Somebody's getting married. There's a wedding. There's good news. What about tears of sorrow? You get bad news. Maybe news about the death of a loved one. Someone is seriously ill and they get bad news and you just want to cry. And what about tears of distress? A certain situation and circumstances arise and you become full of fear and you're worried about the future and one of your reactions is to burst into tears. I was thinking this week, Lord, how do we define tears? Well, somebody could say, well, it's water coming out of your eyes. You'd probably say that in Bush Mills. Yes, well, that's true. But remember, tears are linked to our emotional makeup. They're, they're part and parcel of how we feel in situations of joy and situations of sorrow and distress. I could attempt to give you a chemical definition of tears and break down the chemical components, sodium and calcium, etc. Not going to do that. I could give you a scientific definition of tears. And the scientist talks about a lubricating fluid uh, arising in the eyeball to keep them soft and moist. But I'm not going to do that. I just want you to think of God's definition of tears, irrespective of what the scientist says and what the, 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 the chemists say. Tears really, if you listen to me carefully, are the desolation of the soul. The individual soul in a situation and circumstance is crushed. The, the individual feels that they're pressed beyond measure. He's experiencing or she's experiencing sorrow and heartache. And in that situation, often tears flow in a concentrated manner. You hear mummies here know that when one of your children has fallen in the past and skinned the knee or skinned the elbow and they're in pain, what do they do? Well, they, well, they cry out. You, you've got to dry up their tears. Maybe you're not crying this morning because of a bodily pain, but, but 
but you're hurt inside and you have been hurt by words or actions. And, and when you think and meditate on those uh, actions or those words that somebody has said or somebody has done, will you have this inner feeling within yourself to, to, to have a good cry to yourself? And that's not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of cowardice. Some men, of course, don't want to be seen to shed tears publicly. Do you know Jesus wept? John 11 and 30, shortest verse in the Bible. It's not wrong to shed tears, men. Why? Because tears have to do with the desolation of the soul. And remember, the Bible tells us that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Some people tell us that women cry more than men. Because of their emotional makeup. But I know this that whether women cry more than men or men cry more than women, weeping and crying makes you feel a lot better. Never be ashamed of tears. And we as human beings, this is the way God has made us. Animals can feel pain, but animals do not show emotion. Animals don't have the capacity for the experience of sorrow and joy and grief and heartache. I believe this morning tears are a wonderful gift from God. I believe this morning that tears are the language of heaven. The Bible tells us that there's a time to weep. Tears speak louder than words. Sometimes you don't have to say any words because it's a language that God sees, that God fully understands. And, and, and when you burst into tears, people know. I've been in hospital situations, people's bedside, maybe praying and reading uh, with an individual and someone in the other bed or in another part of the ward has been sitting in tears. Well, well I know there's something wrong. And I can go and say, I'm sorry for your trouble. Whatever's brought you into tears, I would encourage you to look to the Lord for help and strength. And that gives me an opportunity and an opening. See, King David could never have been accused of shedding false tears. Out of those 35 references to tears in the Bible, seven of them belong to King David. Seven. That's... that's um, just under 25% of all the references to tears in the Bible. Seven of them belong to King David. Seven's the number of perfection. His tears are real and genuine. He was no stranger to tears. Listen to what he says in the first reference in Psalm uh, 6 and verse 6. I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. In the privacy of his room, lying in his bed, with only God to see him, there he is, profusely crying unto the Lord. It says there in Psalm 42, and in the verse 3, my tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? See, I want you to just think this morning, Take the two words, my tears, they're real and genuine, and talk to yourself the reality of tears. Notice secondly, and very quickly, I want you to think the reason for our tears. I, I thought of these seven references, especially in the life of David, and I thought to myself, Lord, why? Why tears? What, what's the reason for these tears? Let, let me suggest a few reasons this morning. What about tears because of sin? Here's perhaps the most important reason for our tears. The individual soul making a full and honest confession before God. Genuine tears of remorse. Tears of regret for crimes against God. Tears of repentance over a, a sight and a, and a recognition of sin. See, there was a time in David's life where he was a backslider. Read Psalm 51. There's David's genuine and honest confession for restoration. And in his confession, he says in Psalm 51, My sin is ever before me. I believe he hated and loathed his sin. Uh, why had he remembrance of a sin? Was it to do with the tear bottle and the mantelpiece? You see, David had a realization and a recognition 
I have sinned against God. I have sinned against a holy God. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against my soul and my family. Is there not little recognition of sin today? Is there not a poor and little regard for what sin is? Sin remembers any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. And I believe there's a link between little recognition of sin today and and the talk about a deep, real, genuine repentance. If there's no deep, conscious uh, understanding of our own depravity, then there'll be little or no weeping over sin. Remember the Lord Jesus wept on three occasions. One of them was over the state and condition of Jerusalem. He was thinking about the sins of God's people there. He was thinking especially of the sin of those that rejecting him as Lord and Savior. And he wept over that city with strong crying and tears. The Bible says, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. We, we think of that means just mourning over death. And it includes that. But what about mourning over our sin? Over our depravity? Mourning over the fact that we're sinners in the sight of God. Remember the, the publican in the temple. God be merciful to me, the sinner. And I want to ask this morning. I want to press at home. Young people, boys and girls. Have you ever had a sight of your sinnership? Where, where you're saying my sin is ever before me. And you've come to God and you've cried out. God be merciful to me, the sinner. See, we live in a day of easy believism. Come to Christ and be happy. Come to Christ and be healthy. You'll never be sick. You'll never have a cough or a cold. Come to Christ and be wealthy. Make you a millionaire. Billionaire like Donald Trump. But it's not in the Bible. It's not the teaching of the scriptures. Because in such churches that preach this happy, healthy, wealth gospel, you'll never hear a message, repent ye and believe the gospel. There'll never be a call for a deep acknowledgement of your sin. David, I believe, when he talked about my tears, shed tears over his sin. Shed tears over the consequences of sin in his life and his family. He had a hatred for sin. He had a love for righteousness. He was sensitive. His sin had robbed him of joy and peace and contentment, gladness and assurance in the Holy Ghost. You see, let's remember, young people, sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. Think of Peter. Matthew 26 and 75. Peter wept bitterly. Luke 22, Jesus told him, I have prayed for you, and when they are converted, strengthen thy brother. See, he was a backslider. He was following afar off. He boasted to the Lord, I'll never deny you. I'll go to the grave with you. I'll die for you, Lord Jesus. But he didn't know his heart. Remember, he denied the Lord three times with oaths and cursings. And the Lord Jesus was being tried in the house of Caiaphas. And when he came up out of the steps of the prison house, and I've stood there thinking of the prison below ground. And the Lord Jesus is coming up the steps and being led across the courtyard. And, and he's been led away to Herod's house. Peter's at the fire among the ungodly. He shouldn't have been there. He's warming his hands and Christ looked. And it was a look of love and a look of compassion and a look of desire. And, and Peter remembered the words of the Lord Jesus. I'm praying for you. When the cock crows, thou shalt deny me three times. And Peter remembered that. And Peter wept bitterly. Why did he weep? Because of his sin, his unbelief, his denial of Christ. And you know, when the Lord Jesus comes back to this earth, visibly, literally, tangibly, the Bible says every eye shall see him. And they that shall see him shall mourn because of him. Why? Because of what they've done to him. That brings us to Calvary. That brings us to the place of the shed blood. Remember on his brow, the crown of thorns. They, they plucked off the, the beard from his face. They, they beat him. They, they bruised him. Think of his back left like a plowed field. And then they stripped him naked and nailed him to the tree. And we could say this morning, behold the bleeding sacrifice. Have you ever wept at the cross? Because that's what your sin did to Christ. 
He he offered himself a once and for all sacrifice for sin. Because of your sin and because of mine. Tears because of sin. Have you ever wept at the cross because you saw Christ as a bleeding sacrifice bearing the guilt and punishment of your sin? I have to move on quickly. Tears because of salvation. Do you know when a loved one comes to faith in Christ, comes to the place of repentance and reception of the Lord Jesus, and when I hear the news, well, well, I've got tears of joy in my face. I'm glad for them. I'm thankful they're now in Christ. Once they were out of Christ, but there's been a change in their status in a spiritual sense. That they're now one of God's children. Because the Bible says, But as many as received him to them, give he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you ever wept tears because of the news of the salvation of a loved one? What about tears of sorrow? No true believer is ever exempt from trials and troubles. Jesus said in the world, you should have tribulation. I could list great men in the Bible, great women in the Bible. They all knew what it was because of weep, because of sorrow. Hezekiah, Esther, David, Job, Joseph. Let's just think of Joseph for a moment. 17, he was put into a pit. He was then sold as a slave into Egypt. He then faced prison and false accusation. And he was in prison for 13 years. In the prison, the iron came into his soul, according to the Bible. He found it hard, difficult. Life was a struggle. But the Lord was with him. And he kept faith with God. And the Lord kept faith with him. And eventually, whenever he became the prime minister of Egypt, and eventually when his brothers came to buy food, and he recognized them, he didn't hold a grudge against them. He didn't say, I'm going to get even now. I'm going to hurt and crush my brothers. Oh, no, the Bible says he wept. He he had tears because of his family situation. Maybe you're here this morning and you have tears in your soul because of a family situation. Maybe you're here this morning and because of a family situation, you have been bruised and broken in heart. Someone hurt you this morning. Could I encourage you to seek forgiveness? Could I encourage you to pray for those individuals? Don't hold a grudge. David didn't. David sought reunion and forgiveness despite what was done. God, he says, meant it for good. Ye meant it for evil. And those evil things that have been done, even though they are evil, let's not enter into that spirit where where we're bitter and, and we harbor a grudge. Let's seek for forgiveness. Think of Hezekiah, the godly king. He was told by God, set your house in order, for you're going to die. There he is lying in bed, facing death. And he's praying, and he's weeping. And God says, I have heard thy prayers, I have seen thy tears. Isn't that tremendous? I've seen your tears. I've taken notice of them. You've got my attention now. Was the Lord Jesus not a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief? Did he not weep over the graves of Lazarus, weep over Jerusalem, weep in Gethsemane, the Bible says, in Hebrews 5 and 4, strong crying? The passion and the pouring out of his heart in prayer? See, see, sometimes we ask, does Jesus care? Does Jesus know my struggle? Does he see and understand my sorrow? Yes, he does, folks. No Christian's exempt from trials and troubles. There are such a thing as his tears of sorrow. Remember, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He can identify with us. Think very quickly of tears of service. Psalm 126, verse 6. He that goeth forth and weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Let me tell you this morning about a missionary called John Patton. He went to the outer Hebrides where you could be eaten alive by by cannibals. His wife was expecting a baby. Six months after the baby was born, the baby died. Then his wife died and he was left alone. 
For 10 years, there wasn't one soul saved in the outer Hebrides. But he was faithful to God. He knew that things were difficult, hard to understand. But then over time, he moved to a different island. I can't just remember the name of it. But that whole island was converted by the power of the Spirit. He, he wept in his service. In the United States of America, I'm told that there was a small church with dwindling numbers, a Presbyterian church. The elders got together. What do we do? They're struggling to keep the doors open. Very few were coming in, very little money in the church. And they knew that long-term future, it, it looked bleak. So this is what they did. They had a prayer meeting. And they began to pray and pour out their hearts. And they told the Lord all about this situation. And over the course of three months in one of those prayer meetings, one of the elders stood up and he prayed, Lord, give me back my tears. Give me back my tears. And do I not have to confess this morning about tearless preaching from this pulpit? Hearts not really touched by God. The loss of passion and power. What about tearless praying? Where's the empathy and the sympathy with hardened sinners? And even the hardness of saints and their harsh criticism and treatment of one another? What about tearless practice where we've lost a heart for God and we're not really enjoying God as we ought? What about tearless pastoring where there's a loss of genuine love for people, where people are not valued and as precious as they ought to be in the house of God? And I want to say this morning, I value you, I love you this morning in the Lord. I, I want to help you and do you good if I can. But I've got to face reality. There's an absence of tears. And does it not indicate how hard my heart is? Do we not feel the hardness? Can we not pray, Lord, break me, melt me this morning? I think about Kerry, Hudson Taylor. John Knox, David Brainard. These were all men whose hearts God had touched by the Spirit. A man wrote to William Booth one time. He wanted to quit the Salvation Army because things were hard. No souls were being saved. He thought it was useless and impossible. And William Booth, the leader of the Salvation Army, sent back a telegram with two words. Try tears. It was Knox that cried, give me Scotland or I die. Did Hannah not pray for a child in her heart even though uh, uh, no, no words come out? What about tears for souls this morning? Do, do we value a lost soul? Leonard Ravenhill says God just doesn't answer prayers. He answers desperate prayers. Pr tears before the mercy seat. Weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen, the hymn writer says. Remember the lost this morning on the lap of the evil one. If they die in their sins, Jesus said, where I am, they cannot be. And there's only one of two places. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And, and, and individuals are, are, are hard-hearted today. And, and they're, they're, they're incensed in their wickedness. I've had to ask the challenge, when last did I cry for a lost soul in this house? And you know, I'm thinking of that elder in that wee church, that Presbyterian church in the United States. Lord, give me back my tears. Here's one of the reasons. Tears for souls. What about tears for the sanctuary? Joel 2 and 17. Weep between the porch and the altar. Do you know, do you know the, 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 the porch and the altar was the place of communion with God? And, and the altar was the place of the shed blood. And it was a remembrance that the people were a blood-bought people. And they ought to have been sensitive to that blood sacrifice. Don't forget that blood sacrifice as we come to worship before God. Let's remember we're in the place of communion. We're there to meet with God. And there should be tears over the state of the church today. Is there not a barrenness? Empty pews? 
Don't we want to see these pews filled up? How is that going to happen? Well, well, I must weep between the porch and the altar. Pray for me that God will give grace to this end. Are we not saying in the free church today, 60 odd years into our history, we have half empty churches this morning? Are we not complaining that we're losing young people and the children? And of course, young people need to be loved. They need to be valued. They need to be looked upon as if they, 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 they have a useful purpose in the house of God. And so they have. Do we not need to pray and weep and cry to God? Lord, help us. Lord, turn to us. Lord, remember us. I want to just give you one final thought, and it'll be very brief. The reality of our tears, the reason for our tears... I want you to think of the record of our tears. Look back at our text. Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle, are they not in thy book? See, young people, God is a bottle. It's called a tear bottle. And God is a book. And that tear bottle, it could be three to six inches in length. And that tear bottle is really a symbol of remembrance. And God catches the tears of his people. And every tear that you shed, regardless of whether it's for the sanctuary or the souls or service or or, or whether it's for salvation or or, or whether it's over your sin, that tear's precious to God. And every tear, I believe, sparkles like a jewel before him. Think of Hezekiah now. 2 Kings 20, it was a source of recognition. Not only a symbol of remembrance, but a source of recognition. What did God say to Hezekiah about to die and go into eternity? I have seen thy tears. You see, he prayed. But praying wasn't enough. He says, I've seen thy tears. In other words, you've got my attention now. I'm looking to you, Hezekiah, in that bed of sickness because of your tears. And I have noticed every one of them. And not one of them's unnoticed. Not one of them's not precious. Is it not also a sign of repentance? Remember in Luke 7 in the house of Simon the Pharisee. When someone's supposed to come into your home in the land of Israel. They didn't wear socks and shoes like we do. They, they, they wore sandals. Open sandals. Like, like Moses. Uh, Rosemary hates me wearing her. Did, I'm not allowed to wear them. But anyway. Moses sandals. You know what I'm talking about. The dust and the grime of the um, land of Israel was getting into your feet and in between your toes. And whenever you come in, you're supposed to take your sandals off and someone was to bathe your feet. Well, well, that was the job of the host, Simon. And Jesus is sitting at the table and his feet have never been washed. And in behind him comes a woman. And she starts crying profusely behind Christ and watering his feet. With her tears. She maybe brought a tear bottle with her. I I, I don't know. And then she started wiping. His feet with her hair. And the hair's a woman's glory. It was as if the the hair in her cells. Had become a rag. And she used it to wipe the feet of Christ. She she humbled herself. She she set aside her glory. She poured out her, her, her heart's emotion at the feet of Christ. And it was a sign of her repentance. She was weeping because of her sin. And I want to ask this morning, have you wept because of your sin? And those tears have been a sign of repentance. And God has recognized them. And he's had them in remembrance. And they're now in his bottle. Because God has a record of your tears. Can I tell you in closing, God has a book. Look at this text. Are they not in thy book? Is it surely impossible, in a sense, to catch every tear in a a little tear bottle? But God writes down every tear that's shed. They're in his book. God is a remembrance of them. You hear this morning, and you're saved, but your life's a struggle. You've tried to surrender your all to Christ and you you struggle with sin and struggle to gain the victory. Or maybe you're here this morning, you're just overcome with sorrow and all these situations that have arisen, waves of affliction and trouble in your family and you feel that life is falling apart. Have you prayed with tears to God? Have you supplicated from your heart with passion and power? 
Because every tear God has put into his book, the record of our tears. God's regard for your tears. He sees the reality of them. He knows all about the reason for them. But he has a record. Could I ask this? How many tears are in your tear bottle? How many tears are recorded in God's book for me? That's a challenge, folks. May the Lord give us grace and wisdom as we think about the word of God.